Wow, good morning. Hi, hello, and uh, welcome. Yeah, SpongeBob SquarePants the musical. I've literally no idea why it popped up my YouTube feed. Yes, I do, because I listen to musical theater all the time. So I thought I'd share that with you this morning. Um, I hope you're all well. Good morning. Uh, and welcome to this, our third uh, webinar of the week. Um, wow, feeling the Zoom love. Uh, this is the third in our series that we are doing about funding, uh, aimed logic sector. But what I will say up front, uh, in response to many emails of people saying, oh, I'm not quite the outdoor sector. Can I come anyway? Yes, of course you can. Everyone's most welcome. Um, and uh, we're happy at this time uh, to share the knowledge as widely as possible uh, and learn from each other. God knows we need to. Um, so these have come out um, of, as we entered into lockdown 2.0, uh, we were in one of our fr regular Friday meetings, uh, which we have uh, via Zoom um, and the, the link goes out in the newsletter, so do please join us. If you haven't joined us before, we'd be very, very happy to see you. Uh, and when we went to lockdown, we're like, what are we going to do with this time? So uh, we, the room kind of said, oh, wouldn't it be good to actually spend some time on thinking about doing some of those applications we don't normally have time to do? So we've uh, responded to that by supporting it with um, this series of webinars. We had one um, on Tuesday. Uh, about the Arts Council Project Grants Fund, uh, and then we had one yesterday about the Developing Your Creative Practice Fund. Uh, the recordings of those will be up on the website uh, pretty soon, uh, along with the resources, and we'll do the same here, provided uh, we're all happy and we don't say anything uh, indiscreet or outrageous. Uh, and uh, I'm here supported, oh, I've got lots of, lots of outdoor arts. I've got Lara, I've got Olivia, and I've got Catherine here, so nice to see you all. And then we are joined by, um, Three people from very much from the, the broadest uh, sense of the sector. We have Rosie from the Brick Box in Bradford, Lissy from Mimbra Acrobatic Company, and we have Martin from Tin Arts uh, and Include Festival. So uh, that's that's great. Thank you very much for joining us and letting us dive into your minds on the thorny topic of finding other sources of funding other than the Arts Council, particularly at a time, let's just say, it, when nobody's got any money to do anything with and everyone's changing the terms and conditions of how they're giving money anyway. So, hey, uh, the phrase my dear dad would have used was pissing in the wind. But let's, let's forget that and, and move ahead. Um, so, God, my voice sounds a little bit like Boris Johnson now. I'm so sorry. So, for those of you uh, who don't know, I'm just going to give a little bit of context on what, um, what we're talking about in terms of outdoor arts for people who don't particularly know the sector. If you've been collecting the set and been to all of these, please feel free not to watch because you've seen... Um, this, this slideshow many a time. I have changed it ever so slightly. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what uh, the outdoor arts sector is uh, to those of us who work in it. Uh, I'll start from the beginning. There we go. So um, we are Outdoor Arts UK and we're an Arts Council England supported uh, sector support organisation uh, and we run to, or we work to support and advocate for people who work in outdoor performance. So it's very much the performance side of outdoor work. Um, although we love graffiti and visual arts, we're much more uh, towards uh, areas that, uh, that have performance in them. So what we're looking at today is, oh, no, we're not, there we go. Um, webinar three, uh, that, that's Lissy, Martin, and Rosie, and there's a rough running order of what we'll do. We've not managed to keep to time on the previous ones. I'm sure we'll, we'll 
I'll make it up as we go along. Um, so outdoor arts, uh, very much spectacle that takes place in the public realm. Um, this is in Great Yarmouth. This is a French company taking over the streets of Great Yarmouth with 100 volunteers, or at least I think there are more than 100 volunteers, all in blue face, a wonderful French company. Um, then the other end of it is much smaller events. This is a single person show. This is Abby Collins uh, playing a Russian ballerina dancing on traffic cones because times is hard. So there's all sorts of scales that we work to. There's a lot of processional work in what we do, which has a huge element, obviously, of community participation, very, very important part of the outdoor sector, uh, as well as other parts of the arts sector, of course. Um, there are companies, this is Occam's Razor, a very uh, internationally renowned circus company that works very interestingly with new um, equipment and they have a strong uh, relationship with the outdoors I think this is them outside of Norwich Cathedral um, there's the Greenfield festivals at world now not all Greenfield festivals have a particular performance element because they're very music based again we don't really cover the music side of things this is the Green Man festival uh, in Brecon Beacons in Wales that has a really good uh, commissioning uh, outdoor arts program uh, working with Art Culture which is a, a Welsh advocacy organization for outdoor work um, Carnival, of course, another important part of our sector. Again, there's some of that is very much music based, but a lot of it uh, increasingly has a kind of performance, uh, increasingly is always a performance uh, element to it, but uh, it's sort of becoming more uh, commissioned work as well to some degree. Um, this is, this is, I believe, the only play uh, parade at Include Festival, which is uh, what, Tim Arts Festival. Again, really important to see um, diversity within the sector, outdoor arts very much lends itself towards a very diverse audience and an increasingly diverse uh, set of practitioners. Uh, and this is interesting um, to see. I think this was th this year's include, and Martin will probably tell us a bit more about this. This was the include festival this year that went online. So there's a, there's a filmed outdoor version. We've been seeing quite a lot of that, but um, I do remember I've got that much visual documentation of it. So I'll be glad to find the pick. Um, Mela, another important area of our work. Again, Mela, a lot of it is uh, quite commercial. A lot of DJs, a lot of music in there, uh, and but increasingly performance. Uh, this is Cohesion Plus, uh, Dancing Maharajas. Um, this is the international side. Uh, I love this picture because it's a very intense French circus company under a red London bus at French and Dockings Festival a couple of years back. Um, this is Drag Queen Storytelling, which was uh, a commissioned piece. Uh, I came out of some work I saw at Birmingham Hippodrome and found an interesting place of, of drag queens telling stories to children in the public uh, realm. Uh, this is a, a very typical scene of a show taking place in front of uh, a large crowd of people. I'm not sure where in the world this is, Lissy will tell us, but this is Mimbra. Mimbra, uh, that we'll, we'll be hearing from Lissy about some of their work. Uh, this is uh, a female-led acrobatic company. I'm, I've had the pleasure of being on their board for some time, not anymore, uh, and co-commissioned a couple of shows with them when I, I worked uh, as a producer. Um, and uh, they also have a very strong youth program. We'll be hearing a little bit more about that, uh, very interesting to see that running alongside them as a professional performance company. Uh, another big side is the commercial work, and this uh, this is just a sort of indicator of that. This is um, a stilt company doing their comedy lifeguards, and they very much um, would work through an agency, and that's a really important part of where people uh, find some of their income in increasingly difficult times uh, through commercial, through perhaps local authority events in shopping centres or town squares, uh, animating uh, high streets, uh, animating areas at Christmas time particularly. Uh, and uh, the participation side, this is Cirque du Jus Umbrella Project, really clever piece that has been in many festivals across that clever area being suitable for a light festival and also suitable for a participatory piece, uh, bringing in local community participants um, working in, in, in umbrella dancing formation. I'm in for a formation dancing, not quite sure. Um, and installation work, this is uh, Walk the Plank, uh, an absolute backbone of the UK outdoor sector. This is their fire garden. And that really pleasingly was one of the first shows that uh, we saw this year when it uh, managed to sneak in during a non-lockdown moment at Crenshaw Documents Festival. Uh, and I think it was at Bournemouth Arts by the Sea as well. Um, another area that's worth considering, this is, um, this is Odd Socks production, who, who uh, this is Romeo and Juliet with mods and rockers. Um, Romeo as a mod, Juliet as a rocker. Uh, and they tour, they're, they're very much the circuit, it's an interesting circuit of, of kind of the state of homes and, and uh, private gardens. Uh, and they often work on kind of box office splits and things like that. Bye bye, see you later. Uh, and uh, so that, that's a different part of it, uh, the sector, but nonetheless, very much outdoors. Um, and this is a big community project by, Box. This is Bubble Up. We'll be hearing a little bit more about that. Uh, and, uh, and this is, a, I think, an old picture from, from uh, I'm sorry, the quality is so low. Just I really like 
to remind it reminded me just finding it of a brick box project that was um under under obviously under a motorway um just the the diversity of venue possibilities of the sector is really important uh this i've popped in this is gobbledy Rook theatre uh to represent the commissioned side this is a, a piece that was commissioned uh co-commissioned by without walls which is an important part of our network and again we'll just mention that i'll mention that a little bit at the end um and this is a piece that i've talked about this i really love this because it's so extraordinary this is a um this is written in glow in the dark sand and uh, it's under it's beneath the cutty sark and the names on the on the pavement there are all the people who arrived on the first windrush boat and this was a couple of years back when the windrush scandal was particularly at its height so this crosses that area between activism uh, between action and and art very much so in fact the little wheelie sculpt thing you can see just to the left at the bottom of the steps there that's the thing that it's an automatic robot that writes the names in sound you can see they're very precise um when i had programmed this once i had it doing shakespeare's sonnets not glow in the dark but anyway. um this is a really terrific french piece uh, called the color of time by a uh, company atonic um great uh, explosion of, of culture clash at the end of it where a holy powder fight comes to together with contemporary dance um, and if you look over my shoulder if you're looking at my screen you'll see there's a picture I just put that up there because so many people ask what it is um, so that is uh, my former job uh, was producer of the National Theatre's uh, outdoor festival called Watch This Space which I produced on the South Bank for I, could, I lose track probably about 12 13 years it was um, and that is a French company Studio de Cercle de Marseille performing a wheel of death dressed as comedy waiters a uh, terrifying bit of programming I don't know what I was thinking uh, I have a, a very low threshold to, to uh, terror so anyway that's just a little bit of uh, background as to kind of who we are and why we do what we do a little intro to some of our guests uh, and of course all of that work is um, often free and that's one of the most brilliant things about the outdoor sector uh, by a long way so um, just before we go on just a couple of things if you're you may or may not be new to zoom um, do feel free to tell us who you are um, in the chat window to the right there. It'd be lovely to see who, who you are. We haven't pressed GDPR buttons on the sign up. So if you want your email address to be shared, pop it in there when you say hello. That's absolutely fine uh, in case you make any contacts through this. Um, do put it onto gallery view if you'd rather have one big face or if you want, um, I don't know, gallery view will give you everybody. Uh, speaker view will give you one big uh, screen. Uh, I prefer gallery view because I like looking into people's homes and seeing what books they've got behind them. Um, we'll uh, encourage you to save the chat at the end. Uh, we won't pop that up on the website because it's probably our people's emails addresses. And uh, if you use the three little buttons at the bottom of your, I'm talking about laptops here, uh, the, or, or, or computers, the three little buttons at the bottom of your chat window, click on that and you will be given an option to save chat. And that will, but I'll do it at the end. Wait till there's been some good chat. Um, and we'll, at the end, we'll take some time for questions and I'll go back through chat and just pull up any points, but be feel free to wave your hands at me. So that's who we are. That's what we're doing here today. Let's work out how to get some money for this wonderful work. Um, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to Rosie from uh, the Brick Box in Bradford, uh, who we had a lovely time a couple, uh, oh God, a couple of years, three or four years ago when we used to do live things. Um, we hosted one of our ideas summits in a disused Marks and Spencers, which was a venue a unique venue choice. We hosted that there, and it was lovely to work with you then. And I've been up uh, subsequently to to um, to Bradford to see you. Anyway, Rosie, you're good at getting money from all sorts of different sources. Tell us how it's done. Thanks, Angus, and hi everyone. Um, I'm going to go quite quickly because there's a video I want to show you at the end of this. Um, but yeah, very much around for questions and stuff afterwards. So, um, as Angus said, my name is Rosie. I am one of the two directors that run the Britbox. My partner in crime is called Eleanor Barrett. You may have seen her as well. Um, I am. I recently found out what I do is uh, being a producer, but um, generally, it's the, the two of us. We're ever expanding or contracting team, depending on what's going on. But we're an international arts organisation, but we're based in Bradford in West Yorkshire. We started off life in London, but now we live in Bradford. Um, and our work is often, although not always, outside, and it takes the form of events, of installations, of interventions, which are usually co-produced with audiences and communities that live there. So I think of the art bit as engineering atmosphere, as this kind of using kind of art and love and magic to inspire people to transform places. So we produce these events, we create sort of strategies, and they increase footfall, they build audiences, and they 
get art out there. So um, we are a social enterprise. So the first few years of our work, we won tenders and business support packages to do what we do. And it was actually probably about four years into our existence that we wrote our first Arts Council application. So we kind of come from a, like a world of hustling more than kind of grant, grant writing. So our most common clients traditionally are from local authorities, housing associations, architects, developers, sometimes local trusts, um, and then sometimes regional authorities, but I don't have so much experience with trusts and foundations. So the project I wanted to tell you a bit about was um, the Bradford Bubble Up, which we did in 2018. So you saw that picture of a water slide, 100 meter water slide going down a very street, steep street in the center of Bradford, which felt like an important thing to do. Um, so the Bubble Up Festival was a sort of a citywide three-day festival and it celebrated um, Bradford's relationship with water. So there's actually a river system that runs underneath the city of Bradford that was sort of used by the mills and the Industrial Revolution as, just, as, as, as a sewer um, and therefore it was built over and it became very polluted. And so we felt like there was this really, you know, accessible metaphor to think about how like the, the flow of water and how we can let our creativity bubble up. And it's also, you know, this really nice sort of aesthetic and it really connects with, with a lot of families and stuff like that. So, right, okay, great. We'll do something called the Bubble Up Festival. And um, we kind of imagined it quite big. So um, we worked out we needed 170,000 pounds to do that. And um, we raised that largely through local authority funding from Bradford Council, but also regional authority funding, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, some money from the Arts Council. And then also we got all of the different MPOs in the district to be part of it and give, in, and give some money, as well as the local sort of national, um, Science, National Science and Media Museum, which is part of the Science Museum group. We got a little bit of money from pitch fees from sort of stalls on the day, but actually that was really hard and uh, seemed to take a lot more effort than it was worth. So we'd never really had that sort of regional mu museum um, money before, um, but usually we had relationships. And if we didn't have those relationships, we found people in the local authority who said, oh, we don't have any money to, um, to, to help us sort of have those discussions. So I feel like we were successful because one of, the re one of the strategies was telling everyone that everyone else was involved already and that it would be really embarrassing if they weren't at the party too. So it was this sort of thing where like, well, you know, it, you need to be involved. So we also spent quite a lot of time um, making sure that we hit people's targets in terms of their reporting and things like that. So the MPOs, for example, the MPOs all were really keen to get the figures and that we collected through evaluation um, in terms of audience and participation, but also in terms of footfall and stuff like that. Um, and I think one of the things which is fantastic about working in the art, outdoor arts sector is you do, which Angus referenced, you do have that kind of diversity of audience and experience. And it's one of the reasons why I find it much easier to raise funds when I'm doing work outdoors and when I'm doing work indoors, really. And I'm, I find it more interesting anyway. Um, so in terms of the impact of that project, um, it definitely sort of led to, it felt like a strategic project which we developed in conjunction with the local authority. So it led to this kind of more joined up approach across the whole city. So there was this kind of ambition at the time sort of that Bradford needed to be further on than where it was. So actually we kind of tapped into this one from the Arts Council regionally from the regional authority from the local authority but also from the mpos of we need to be kind of like great you know we can be more than the sum of our parts so actually that kind of paved the way to some more big bucks funding in bradford which which has come in recently so now there's a really serious uk city of culture 2025 bid there is a creative people and places thing called the leap which is which we secured last year there's something called the bradford producing hub which you may have heard of there's just two producing hubs which are in the country i think the other one's in derby but they're kind of like strategic arts council funding and then the, also something got created called the bradford cultural voice forum which was a tender that then went out we won and now um, we basically, we the Britbox coordinate this kind of forum of, of people working in arts and culture across the whole district. So it's led to this more, I don't know if the word is collegiate, but kind of together reworking vibe in the city, which has been really good. So there's been some other really good legacy impact from the project. There's been more sort of a more innovative approach to sort of empty space and public realm activation. There was a business improvement district that was voted in as a result of a kind of more cohesive, um, well, 
and we, we influence, not necessarily a direct result of thing, but we definitely influenced a kind of positive vote for the business improvement district. And we also were able to sort of prototype events, which could then go on to get their own separate sort of funding streams. Um, we also gave some support to the libraries in Bradford, which were experiencing cuts. And so they had lots of good beefy data to go to unions with and um, encourage kind of collaborations with different partners. So for example, in Bradford, we've got two literature festivals. We've got the Bradford Literature Festival and we've got the Ilkley Literature Festival. They hadn't worked together before and we encouraged them to work together for and gave them the kind of stuff to do. So we also created this sort of positive narrative around the city, which is much easier said than done in Bradford. So um, I'm going to show you now, I've got enough time. So I'm gonna show you a little, it's a, just a three minute film, which shows you kind of like, this is what happened on the weekend of the Bubble Up Festival. Um, and I'll pop my email in the chat and you're very, very welcome to get in touch with me and ask me things. So I'll do that now. It's about the waterway, it's about connecting people with it, knowing that they're actually there in the first place. It's a water festival and, and we're, we're mermaids, we love water. We're like, oh, mate, rock. People are looking for us in Bradford. So my wife was looking at you, there was something about bubbles going on. My son was bubbles, so yeah, that's where we are. I'm at the Bradford Bubble Up and I've been on the water slide. Been going on a bubble slide, and bubbles at the end, quite fast and very wet. Awesome to get covered in bubbles and massive slides. I came down to the Miracle at midday to see Dancer with a massive fountain at the end, which was really fun. So we're from the Bastille, um, but I did see the event yesterday, so I decided to bring the children today. We went to the sub and got to see the art that was being made there. We're over here performing. We've been finishing away yesterday, and we've been dancing with our fans around the Miracle today. I am in Susan Park, and I've been dancing. Me and my sister, we've been taking part in the shows that have been going on to everyone else was joining in. I felt kind of wonderful after it. I felt a bit nervous. There's so many people around that I felt a bit shy. Just to get people out and, you know, mingling together and playing together. This event has brought us to Bradford. We don't normally come into the Bradford City Centre. Every time I come, there's always free events or music going on. and So there's always something to do. I live in Bradford, so I like to find out things going on and go to as many as possible. I really like the community vibe. Bradford's pretty good at hosting sort of festivals and events in City Park. So it's quite Bradford-esque, I think. Not many other cities do this, so it's also Bradford. I love the fact that Bradford it has school. Bradford seems to be a place where you belong, you make your home, and uh, I love that about Bradford. The community that you get in Bradford to live. It's about us having a voice, us having power, us being seen, us being heard, us being creative, us coming together as one. It's just been a really lovely couple of days. Despite the weather, everyone's been in really good spirits and it's been really good fun. So true to its name of the water festival, uh, it absolutely hammered it down with rain for three days straight, um, which, was, uh, <laughs> which was funny after a summer of extreme heat and uh, potential water shortages. We had to deal with the exact opposite thing. But as you can see, it, like, you know, still loads of people came and it was really good. But um, yeah, hopefully that kind of gives you a bit of context for kind of why we could kind of raise the kind of funds from all these different pots because we really really focused on the kind of the crossover there with like yes art but also regen and neighborhoods and community cohesion and all the different things so yeah around for questions in a bit
And the quote I've taken, Rosie, is together a working vibe. That's what we <laughs> need in life. Uh, but that's great. I think uh, that thing of the jigsaw is so important um, in terms of these, these kind of events. Uh, also really interesting hearing you talk about uh, we talk so much about local authorities, regional authority funding, Lordy, that's something that kind of disappears off my radar whenever I'm talking about it. So it's really good to be reminded of that. Not that I'll have any money, but you know, that's cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, of course it rained. That's outdoor arts, but that's the point. Well done for programming a water festival when you knew it was going to be pissing down for three days. Great. So now then, on, uh, on now to Trust and Foundation. So we're going to have uh, talk to Martin from Tin Arts. Um, and one, I'm just going to give a quick uh, sort of preface for you, Martin, is it, it's really hard for people talking about trust and foundations because they're very personal relationships that people have. And I'm just going to urge everyone not to immediately write to everybody that Martin mentions and go, we hear that you love giving away money. <laughs> and you gave it to us now, so now you'll give it to us. It's all about, as I'm sure Martin will it's all about a strategic, measured, sensible approach or not. Martin, over to you. Thank you for joining Hopefully us. Hopefully it'll sound like that, yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all, wherever you are. Um, I'm very I'm very envious of Jojo in the Bass Street Theatre's blue sky behind her, because I'm sitting, I, have, I, can't, I keep turning the light on and off, I can't decide which one's darker and, or lighter. And, and it's a slightly uh, miserable Durham Northeast weather at the moment, as we wait to hear about our impending tier X, Y, and Z we are going to end up in soon. Jojo so is I'm now showing off, the... I'm afraid. Jojo's showing off her view. All right. <laughs> Doesn't make me feel any better about that at all, Jojo. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm the director of Tin Art. Um, we're a dance development organisation based up in the northeast of England. We deliver inclusive dance training to people of all ages and backgrounds across the north. We work for national and international touring, both to indoor and outdoor settings. So, definitely have a part of us which sits in the outdoor arts world, but there's a lot of our organisation which sits away from the outdoor arts world, be it in community settings, schools, indoor theatres, and a lot of arts work in hospitals as well. So there's lots of different types of foundation relationships we have. Um, I will drop my email address in the chat box uh, afterwards if you want to get in touch at all. Um, and uh, so, so we are 21 years old, and in that time we've discovered and worked through all different ways of funding. And, and I am old enough to have been through all sorts of different funding initiatives, some which the Arts Council led, some about, you know, there was a time when local authorities had, in the Northeast particularly, had local arts officers who you built relationships with. So my kind of fundraising background is all built on conversation and discursive and discussions, building relationships with funders so they understand who you are and you understand who they are and what drives them. Um, uh, so in that kind of time, uh, 21 years, Essentially, my job is to work alongside the artistic lead, the artistic team, to realise the ambitions of the team. Um, so it, it's not a, a shared endeavour. So there are 15 people in the organisation. There are not 15 fundraisers. There essentially is one fundraiser, and that's me. And there are people who kind of specialise into those areas. And so my job is to resource the ideas and get the ambition together. Um, like I said, we've got a mix of, uh, of income. Uh, it can be, and the grant funding can be used for all sorts of things. We can go and get grants to support very short activities. We got a grant last week from a local foundation, and it's to provide arts activities on DVDs for people with learning disabilities who lived in isolated or sheltered housing because they have no internet access or access to cultural activities at all. That was a £3,000 written on the back of one piece of A4 paper to quick fund application. We know that foundation really well. At the same time, some of our applications are three to five years and they're, they're, they're kind of in the hundreds and thousands of pounds and they're much more, they require a lot more paperwork and they're certainly not written on the side of the pay for. There's work plans and timelines and risk assessments and all sorts of stuff that, that I could bore you with for hours. And as a side note, if you ever want templates for risk assessment, work plans, timelines, budgets, I'm more than willing to share anything. Because I believe as a kind of, as a stronger sector, all working hard and doing good things, then we, we make that case about why culture is really important in our country. So if nothing is to be, I don't protect anything, I will have to keep access to show you anything you want to know about what we do. Because um, that's what happened to me when I was younger and people were kind enough to show me the way. So I'm happy to kind of help other people along the path as well. So what have I learned? Um, it's an interesting thing. I think in our 20 years, through grants and foundations, I probably raised around about five million pounds overall across those 20 years. I've probably failed in about five million pounds worth of applications as well. And when I look back on learning, 
Where we have been successful is where I've been able to understand the funder, have a discussion, talk about who we are and what we do and how we do it, and then understand what the funder is looking for, what outcomes they have, and how they can look to see that grow. Where I have failed miserably is when it's been much more of a mass call out where people say, uh, here's a fund, apply to it. There's no relationship with the fund. But it's very hard to understand what the right answer is and how to apply for that. And invariably, we've fallen on our backside because of the kind of things we do. Maybe I, I don't articulate myself very well on paper, but I, I, I'm better articulating towards people who build relationships. So I can look through all the funders we have now as an organization. And currently, we're about 400, 500,000 pounds to another. I'd say about 250,000 pounds of that is, is grants. And I could tell you the, the name, the person, what they look like, what kind of coffee like to drink, all the funders I work with, because it gets to that level. Now, obviously in the last nine months, I've not had many coffees with anybody, I've gone to you. Neither have I seen anybody apart from my own immediate family. However, generally with our funders, I can tell you who the people are, I know something about them, they know something about me, and we've built strong relationships over this time. So certainly one thing is, Get, if you have the time and capacity, try and get to know who it is you're working with and who you're going to talk, be talking to funds about. Because um, invariably, they, actually, they want people to make good applications. So they want to help you and they want to talk with you through the process. Because the last thing they want to do is to read hundreds and hundreds of applications which are just ill-founded, cold, and have no bearing on understanding who that funder is. Actually, they want to help you to make a good application. So, so I think remembering that funders and grant givers are human beings, just like me and you, who want to do good things and help good people is, is really important. They're not, they're not a bureaucratic thing who are trying to catch you out with wrong answers. So that's kind of something that I was caring for. I'm going to talk a little bit particularly about Esme Fairburn Foundation. I, if you wanted to find a fan club, I'd be number one in their list. Esme Fairburn are a really modern thinking, proactive, responsive fund. Uh, and again, it's about their approach to this. They, uh, they don't believe in a kind of right and wrong place. They believe in understanding what it is you're trying to achieve and how best they can help you achieve it. And whether they are the best people to help you achieve it. Because sometimes they're very thought thoughtful and helpful about saying, actually, we're not the best people positioned to help you through that process. Maybe you should talk to X or maybe you should talk to Y. Because there's a lot of the top foundations talk to each other quite a lot. The program we uh, have been developing with Esme Fairburn actually started back in 2011. So we've got a nine year relationship with Esme Fairburn. Um, and the most recent one is called the Talent Hub. And it's a, a professional development program. It's an indoor theatre project. Uh, and it uh, looks at supporting talented dance artists with learning skills with autism, develop the skills and experiences to be able to enter the professional dance sector. There is a trailer, um, but I'm going to drop the trailer into the chat so you can go and look at it in your own time, just so. Um, there's also people in my offices teaching Zoom next door, and I don't want to be the one that causes their sessions to crash. Um, so uh, I'll put that in there. And the, and the reason why Esme Fairburn and the Talent Hub sit together is because there's a very close strategic uh, alliance, if you like. So the Talent Hub is a concept that explores ideas around who are the future performers, creators, and makers um, uh, of the culture in our country. It looks about uh, greater diversity and levels of equality in the arts sector. And currently, if you go and look at Esme Fairburn's new strategy particularly, there's a lot of work about who is missing out and who is facing significant barriers to engage as creators, leaders and makers in our cultural sector. So it's no coincidence that that program sits with that funder because time and effort has been taken to understand what was our ambition, who might be interested in that conversation and how one might work with it. So that kind of alignment of strategy, agenda, direction, ambition, whatever you want to call it, but crucially, the vision and missions are aligned quite nicely. Now, it's fair to say, if it was a different funder, um, we would still be as passionate and about as, as committed to that programme as we could. But we also understand that there is a sense that we might have to compromise our programme to talk to the funder about what they're looking to achieve through their funding as well. So the Talent Hub is born out of a relationship between ourselves and ESME. It's not just us saying, take it or leave it, that's what we're going to do. It's actually born out of that relationship with Esme to understand what their outputs are, where they feel society is moving, and how we can contribute towards that. So we help, we help shape the program that way. And in terms of the process, uh, yeah, there's lots of paper and submissions of documents over several stages and work plans. Um, but there's always one question which comes up, and, and if you do any project lottery grants with Arts Council, it's a question that you'll recognise that comes late in the process. But this sits with Esme as well. There's a question that comes up and goes, so how do you know this is needed? 
And this is the point where you go, you are, you've articulated your idea, your ambition, your plan, your budget, your work thing, and then they go, yeah, but how do you know this is needed? Or are you making an assumption? This is I think it's really interesting because I'm, I'm, I think there's a fair chance that everybody in this room would, would say that arts and culture is really important. The personal, social development benefits for, cult for people across society is amazing. And, and, but that's not, that doesn't work in an application because that's not a, a kind of, uh, it's not evidencing that this is needed in a particular area. So what we've done a lot of work on is making sure the voice of those people who should benefit most from the application is at the heart and centre of the application. So when we applied for this work around developing talented artists with learning with autism, they were part of the process of developing an idea. Their voices appear in the application itself. They presented the need from their perspective. In that sense. Um, so we've been always very keen that that we make sure that the need is not an assumption but is a proven thing. There are some things that are hard to prove and, and, and anybody who makes work or gets commissioned to do outdoor work will go well how do I prove there's a need for the type of idea I want to realise whether it be five people stood on top of a pole that's six foot up. But I guess the need comes from the gap or the trends in work being created or a festival needs a much more socially distant piece of work than that 2021 and that work needs to be non-touch and that work needs to be able to move and be in and out quite quick. You start to identify what the needs are of festivals and or potential commission funds. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so um, building that, understanding what the need is um, are kind of the, the things that have been most successful in what we've done and hopefully are useful to you. Be passionate about what you, what you have to share, talk about it as much as you can, but also know that for every pound you raise, there'll be a pound you don't raise. And it's not a, it's not a win. There's no, there's no person I've ever met who is the ultimate fundraiser who can fundraise across all things. I am great at trust and foundations. And I, I think we've got quite a good working history. I am pretty rubbish at mass call outs that are cold calling. And I just have to compete with everybody else because I don't do very well in that process. So it's also understanding which funds play to my strength and developing the right programs that sit with those kinds. So that was a bit quick and hopefully a bit micro, but hopefully useful. Very much so, Martin. And it's it, no, it's really good to hear you talk so clearly about trust and foundations. It, it, it's, it's it's a complete uh, black spot on my own personal experience. Uh, so I've always deferred. I, I'm good at the mass call out, so we'll work together. But that's brilliant. Thank you so much, and thank you for being so honest about that relationship thing. It's an echoing theme here. It's about building relationships. We we know that it's not a quick win but um yeah that's great thank you so much um so we're going to move on now to uh, uh lissy from mimbra so mimbra uh outdoor and indoor circus company um lissy have you seen that call out from jackson's lane for christmas yeah i have seen it and um I, I just thought of you guys because you're yeah um jackson's lane which is a really wonderful uh, venue they always host a christmas um they open their doors on Christmas Day to, to local people who haven't got anywhere else to go. They can't do that this year. And they, do, they usually do a show for them and, um, and free meal. And this year they can't do it. So they're asking circus artists, and it's paid work, I hasten to add, to uh, go around and perform in people's homes and perform in care homes on Christmas Day while they're having their Christmas lunch. Uh, that's the marvellous Jackson's Lane. Uh, great little enterprise there. Anyway, I thought of Mimbra and I thought of your contacts. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that while we're here. Sorry, that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, so, Lissy, do, do talk to us. I've, I've asked you to focus on crowdfunding because you're one of the few companies who's done it well. And I know when I was on your board, I think before your time, crowdfunding came up and I went, that's a terrible idea, don't do it. And then, of course, you guys proved me wrong. Prove me wrong again, please, Lissy. <laughs> Yeah, hi, hello everyone. I'm Lissy. I'm the executive director of Mimbra. And in fact, the board meeting that Angus mentions was my first ever board meeting for the company. I'd only just- I'm been... so sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was such a like, uh, yeah, in at the deep end slightly. I didn't anyway. resign over the matter, you understand. I just happened to be, yes, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all good. Um, so we perform um, acrobatic theatre um, at kind of street festivals around the UK and Europe. You saw an image earlier. And we also run a youth programme um, in a community hall in Hackney. And so it's that that I'm specifically going to be talking about because our crowdfunding campaigns have all been to support that program. So the first time we ran it, as Angus mentioned, was in 2015. And at that point, we'd previously been pretty successful with trust and foundations 
money for the program. Um, and in fact, I think we started it with some of the money that was knocking around to do with the Olympics in 2012. But we hadn't been successful for a bit and we were having to kind of prop the program up from other aspects of our budget. So we decided in late 2015 to run a crowdfunding campaign. And that first year, we were really successful. We raised £3,000, which was amazing and really helped us to run the program. And one of the things that made it successful was we hadn't ever asked for money for that program before. Um, previously, it had always been free for the young people involved. Um, and so we were very careful when we were thinking about it, about who our, who the different people we were going to ask for money were. So it's worth thinking about like the different cohorts of people. So one of the groups was the, the young people's families and their families and friends. Um, the next group was like our personal family and friends. Now, I'd only just started with the company, so this wasn't so true for me, but if you work in the arts, very often, you know, it's not just a job, it's actually very associated with who you are. So it's possible if you have kind of friends who don't work in the arts and have slightly better paid jobs, that they might be people who give you money, which again, tips everything back over towards people who are privileged, but you know, it's the truth. And the third group of people that were very supportive to us was actually the rest of the sector. I was blown away by how generous some of our colleagues were. Um, that first year, we used a platform called Indiegogo, um, which was pretty good actually. Um, and I think if you were a crowdfunding show, perhaps it would be really great, um, but it's set up more for like commercial projects like people who are bringing products to market so we had various levels of kind of perk that you could get if you gave a certain amount of money and with hindsight i'm not sure that we needed to do that it was quite a lot of admin for my colleagues and and i think because we were asking for money for something that was obviously quite charitable we maybe didn't need to do it. Um, we've run the campaign again in 2017 and 2019. And both of those times we used Just Giving. And Just Giving is set up really well for charities. We have a charity and it made it much easier for us to claim the gift aid that was associated with it. Um, we've since closed our account with, <laughs> with Just Giving. And in 10 minutes, I don't have enough time to go into why, but uh, anyway, they are still very, very good. Um, I am, yeah, so we always, each year we've run the campaign, we have begun in kind of a late November and done it in the run up to Christmas and maybe closed it kind of in the new year. I think it seems to be generally known that people are more likely to give you money when, when it's coming up to Christmas. I don't know why that is. Um, there's something about kind of gifts, maybe. No idea, but it's quite a good time to run them. And we send out maybe one or two emails to our mailing list. So yeah, if you're thinking about running one, do you have a mailing list? Um, maybe put one together, a couple of GDPR, all of that. Um, quite very regular calls out on social media, like on Facebook and Twitter and so on. Um, and for each one, we have also made a film. But I'm going to show you the film from our 2019 one. And hopefully, while I am doing that, uh, I will have... Is this going to work? Oh, I can't do and talk at the same time. I will have a look at my notes and uh, make sure that there isn't anything that I've forgotten to tell you. Um, if you can't hear this, let me know. Hopefully you will. At Milton Gardens Community Hall in Hackney, for young people aged 4 to 14. We do dance, we do acrobatics, and it's all for us local kids. <laughs> We also get to make a 
your own moves and balances, which is really fun when we manage. <laughs> We need your help now to keep running these classes and make sure that everyone in our community is able to take part. Give us all your money! Or even just a little bit. Cool, so... Um, Utterly shameless. Completely. I mean, this is the thing. This is what I haven't spoken about. It's like the tone that you use. Um, yeah, the children, like the young people had input into that film, like it was made by a, a professional filmmaker, but they got to kind of film some of it and have input into it, which I think is, makes it feel less, I don't know, a bit less, uh, it makes it feel more, makes it, makes it more authentic rather than even feeling more authentic. Um, you, yeah, how we always try to be a little bit careful about the tone that we're using. There's there's, I mean, it's not just in this day and age, there's always a lot of um, um, important things going on and calls on people's money. So we always try to go, um, to go like, look, we run this programme, we would love to keep it free for the children who need it to be free. If you can give us money, we'll be so grateful, but if you can't, absolutely don't worry about it. Um, and the final thing we have done to, share it so we're going to share my screen again hopefully is in 2019 we made these postcards which we gave to the young people and their families and the class um so the front of them had pictures of the young people being very cute and the back had um a request for a call out for like you know could you could you maybe if you can contribute to our youth program. Um, I'm not sure that these were like super successful, but they were worth a try. The idea was that the, the families of the young people might might hand them out to their friends or you know share it wider. Um, I'll stop sharing that so I can see myself again. Um, yeah, I think we've covered nearly everything. Oh yeah, the last thing was so so in the first year we made £3,000, which was amazing, um, and we had originally, I think our original target was 1500 and there was a couple of days when we were having to like revise the target upwards, which were a bit sticky. And it's tricky choosing the amount that you think you might get, because if you go too high, you've like failed if you don't get that much money. Um, and if you go too low, there's a chance that people will look at, at the crowdfunding campaign and go, oh, well, they've reached their target. I don't need to give them any money. So um, ideally having a plan for, for when you decide to like change your mind about what you're asking. And the unexpected learning from it all was that once we were out there saying to people, like if you give us some money then this is how we will spend it and we will spend it wisely we have had like the odd individual give us like quite large amounts of money so we had a very big donation from spin city ariel um and also a big donation from one of the youth program parents um and that youth program parent at the beginning of lockdown gave us three thousand pounds out of the blue through his like salary sacrifice scheme at work, not salary sacrifice. You can have a scheme where like a little bit of your, um, your salary gets put into a, a thing um, and then you can give it to charity. And I don't know if we hadn't have been open about being very happy to receive money, whether or not we would have got that. So, so yeah, that's the unexpected learning. If you make it available, people sometimes blow you away. I'm sorry, I've run over by 30 seconds. I can only apologise. You're fine. No, you're fine. You're good. <laughs> um, really interesting looking at the film because one thing I really noticed about it is the tone seems spot on for what you're fundraising for. And it feels very, very different from the rest of Mimbra's work and indeed the tone of, of your other films, which are uh, obviously a part of a completely different area of, of work. But they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not like that. They're not like some crazy kids doing TikTok. So I think that's really interesting. And the other thing I think you've referred to there is I, the bit I find most uncomfortable is the public nature of it. 
in terms of that success or failure uh, and where you set that bar and the number of times. In fact, just while we were doing I was looking up a couple of examples that I remembered and suddenly I'm seeing it says, this unfortunately failed to be, and I was like, one of them was rebuilding Bastille Art Centre. I was like, I know that happened. I can see it, you know, it's near me. Um, so it's, it's really weird, that kind of, that public side of things, but the availability is, is kind of very interesting. Um, just if it's there, then at least you've got the option. Uh, wow, that's really useful. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for being um, so frank. Now, there were some questions there about, do we have to be charities to be on Just Giving? Or I don't know about other platforms. What about other platforms? You referred to a couple. Um, Jojo, you were asking about is national fundraising. Um, does anyone, anyone have any other platforms for this part of the work that they, they know of, that they've heard good things about, or they've even used? Not right uh, the actual crowdfund one. Yeah, I, that's the one I was just, crowdfunder. Uh, that's the one I was just, just looking at. I think I was involved in that. Space Hive, I don't know that at all. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a murky old world, um, all of that. There are so many options. Uh, and then every time Facebook no. always asks me on my birthday to raise money for something. Yeah. Great, thank you, uh, all of you put your email addresses in there. Right, anyone, anyone got anything else um, that I've missed in the questions? Do just wave at me. Jojo, was that a finger in your sunny? Yes, it, it was, it was a finger. I'll put up a link in a moment, but we have just signed up with um, national fundraising. We are not a charity. We have a constitution and they accepted that. Um, and I'm hoping and feeling that, um, that it's going to have the right tone and it's really interesting to hear you talking about that because that's the thing that we are most anxious about is getting the right tone um, and we're just about to launch it all properly we're just sort of doing the last bits and pieces on our website in conjunction with our archive project but for a new show and Angus I'd quite like to send you the link to see your thoughts on it before I send it all off but yeah I mean I'll, I'll put the link up and see what people think. Cool, thank you, Jojo. That'd be good to look at that. Um, yeah, people talking about the more combos there. Yeah. Big give. I don't know what big give is. Anybody anybody got any more info on that? Um, I've used it before when I was with Frozen Light. Sorry, I've got my yeah. camera off. Um not see you, but yeah. <laughs> um it basically when we did it we did uh christmas fundraising uh before that before i joined them the previous administrator had raised i think it was from the trusts at the time because it was just one that was prepared to do it but basically the trusts pledge money as match funding to whatever you raise from the crowdfunding so then when you do the crowdfunding you can say whatever you donate will be doubled because it will um and then obviously, depending how the trusts deal with it, it depends with your relationship with the trust. I think the one that we had probably would have given us a bit of money uh, anyway. Um, but yeah, it, it can work really well. And it's really attractive for people donating because it's like, oh, I donate five pounds and they get 10 pounds and they don't know the work that happened with the trust beforehand. It's if you've got time and a relationship that that would work, then it's great. Um, it might be a bit tricky to do if you're not really confident with uh, trust funding or crowdfunding. <laughs> so. Cool, that's, that's interesting. Rosie, can I just ask you, do you have any sense, um, and we love your friend, by the way, uh, <laughs> do, do you have any sense of, of um, local authority where they're at given current situation? Is, it, is there any point in spending too much time? I'm only asking for hearsay there. I'm not asking for an expert opinion. I mean, I can only really, so this is Freddie Mercury, by the way. Um, <laughs> I can only really speak from Bradford's perspective, but this year there were at least two large scale festivals that they couldn't put on. And therefore they, they diverted funds um, into very sort of public call outs, which was great. So there will be for other, for other local authorities, there will be money um, there, which they can't just whip away that quickly because they're local authorities and um does need to be spent on on arts and culture so 
but you know our, our funding often comes by the regeneration department or something like that so it's worth kind of speaking across sort of different different departments and depending on how the local authority works also speaking to local councillors because there'll be councillors that have the portfolio for arts culture and regeneration or whatever so that that's quite an important thing as well here yeah but i think it's i think it's always worth asking and even if they say oh you know there's no money around da, 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 then often people working in local authorities will be very connected and can point you in other directions sure uh, and i think uh, you're right absolutely it will vary from local authority i mean so you know just when you've seen stuff around permissions of doing outdoor events some mm. are saying not in a million years during COVID, and others saying, yes, it's totally what we need to do. I guess the same applies. Um, Martin, I just wanted to, um, do, do you have any sense about, uh, have uh, our trusts and foundations, I, I, I looked very early on in COVID nightmare and saw that they were kind of being really brilliant about being upfront about saying, look, we know everything's changed. Don't worry, we'll look after you if you're already working with us. Uh, are they, do you think that they're going to start shifting some of their parameters because of the, the current situation? And do you, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just asking, do you think that will make it harder or easier to get in there? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so there's a few answers to that. And obviously, uh, personal disclaimer, this is my, <laughs> my take on it. And it's not, a, a, of course. it appears that there's a couple of things happening. A lot of charities, their funds essentially are drawn down from endowments from large pools of funding. So their personal private funds that they use to distribute are on a diminishing scale at the moment because of the impact on markets and stuff. So there's a kind of real financial aspect is that they essentially have less money going forwards. Um, so the practicality of that, the funders we're talking to are doing one of three things. One is they are seeking to work with those they already have relationships with and are less likely to work with new people. Two, um, the alternative strategy is that they are funding shorter projects, so they talk more of 12 to 18 months and less of three years. Uh, or three, they talk about working with less organisations but with larger amounts of money to fundamentally look at how society is shifted. And I don't mean in the sense of now it's all about digital, but more about we, who, who are those groups who've been left most behind in the last 12 months? Actually, the levelling up agenda, I guess. Really. So that, that seems to be my three kind of senses. There is a little bit less money around. It'll be harder to get it, but when you do get it, you might well get more of it for a longer sustained period if you get the right relationship with funders. That, that's really helpful, and I totally take it to your personal opinion. It would be what I would assume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What you're saying. But that's, yeah, uh, obviously, again, uh, total disclaimer, but every, every trust and foundation will be different. Um, really handy, thank you, Lara, perfect timing. Um, so that's where we'll update um, the previous webinars and indeed today's once we've kind of gathered everything um, we'll get those links so that we can show so you can have a take take a look at all those three films um in not quite so choppy a way uh so our weekly uh meeting takes place at four o'clock on a friday uh to get into that we'd love to see you it's dead informal it's completely open doors we just share information sometimes it's curated if we've got something to curate sometimes it's not we just have a chat uh, and once in a while I even if there's an event going on i do it live from somewhere and i think the next one i'm going to hopefully do it from a light festival uh, in Leonardsley in a couple of weeks. Um, I quite like doing that. It makes me feel like I'm a roving reporter. Anyway, um, the link for the, uh, Laura will pop the link up for the newsletter. We send that out usually on a Friday morning and then at four o'clock you join us and we have a chat there. Uh, and you've got the resources link there. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention is, is there's a, there are of course commission programs. So the big one for the outdoor sector particularly is the Without Walls Commission program. It has an open call at the moment for Blueprint R&D. Uh, that's that's live right now, uh, but uh, again, they're, they're a kind of key commissioning part of this. They're not a funder in that sense. It definitely is a commissioning program, which is slightly different from fundraising, uh, but it's just worth remembering that. And there are other pots of commissioning. A lot of those are on hold at the moment uh, because of current situations, but fingers crossed. There's the, thank you, Laura. There's the without walls. Um, I'd love to finish uh, on a top tip from each of our marvellous guests. Rosie, what's your top tip for getting getting cash through the doors? Um, well, it actually really echoes what Martin was saying, and it's about forming those relationships um, and really sort of understanding like how you can meet a funder's needs because they need you to do what they say they do. Um, and the other mantra I would pass on as well is remembering 
that you are not just the applicant, you are the prize. We like that. That's a little poetic for a Thursday morning. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Martin, how about yourself? That's very good. I'm writing that one down. Give me a second. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is uh, be ready to be ready to show the need. When, when that question comes, who, why is this needed? Be ready to show it and have done the background work to get that right, front and centre of your application. All in the prep, quite right. Lucy, how about yourself? Make it easy for people to give you money. There you Put go. Put a PayPal link on your website, open a fundraising page. Someone wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks, God, I really want to give some money to an arts company. Make it possible for it to be you at least. I, 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 most nights, most nights, it's usually three in the morning. Oh, I must give some money to remember. Brilliant. Um, Rosie, Martin, Lucy, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and uh, it's been really useful, really good to, to think beyond uh, our, our I, I get into a little bit, I admit, a little bit of a kind of an Arts Council blinkered situation. So it's been brilliant to think about. Beyond that, um, I'll leave it open for a while. So if you want to save the chats, there's, there are all sorts of really useful links and email addresses in there. All of our guests have very kindly put their email addresses up. We also do one-to-ones on a regular basis, but they're pretty much booked up for the rest of the year. Rosie, you're doing some today for us, aren't you? You're sold out. I'm doing some today. I'm sold out. Oh, it's sold out. It's one person. Sounds so grand, doesn't it? Um, uh, but we're doing a few more. We're going to put a few more up. Um, and again, they'll be advertised in the newsletter. So all the more reason to sign up. Have a very nice um, rest of Thursday. I hope you get sunlight like uh, Jojo's got down there in Cornwall. Uh, and maybe we'll see you tomorrow at four o'clock. Be lovely. Thank you all so very much. I'll leave this open so you can save the chat and uh, take care. Get some money. Let's get this sector back on its, back on its feet. Oh, sounds like Boris Johnson again. I'm so sorry. Angus, how do we save the chat? No. Go down I'm not sure who by that. going down into the chat box, it says file, and then there's three dots next to it. Click that and save the chat. Lara, have you any idea how to do it on an iPad? We don't have the dots, so. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I'm not too sure on an iPad, but I'm saving it and we're going to upload it to the page, I think. We'll have to check because I think people have put email addresses in it. Um, but we can always email it to you, I think, if you get in touch with us. So That would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be really good because I can't save it on an Android either. <laughs> okay, yeah, shoot us an email and we'll try and get it over to you. I think it yeah. might not be possible, unfortunately. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye. Bye. Clara, should we have a should we have a quick catch up after? Thank you. Paul, it was the prize. <laughs>
Great. Hello. You're muted. There we go. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Did you actually turf them out? Yeah. Oh, good. Well done. That's right. I'm just in the room. Oh, yeah.